All right, um, we are going to continue on here with unit number three, and we're going to talk about agonists, antagonists, and partial agonists. I think we have not used these terms yet, although we will use them a lot from this point forther, forward. Pardon me. So in the last um, video, we talked about the receptor theory of drug action, and I said that most drugs work by interfacing with a receptor in some way, whether they're stimulating that receptor or blocking that receptor. So the question here on the screen asking if drugs stimulate <clears throat> or inhibit normal receptor activity, well, the question, the answer to that would be, I just said it, would be either really or both. It depends on the drug. So there are drugs that will stimulate a receptor and those are called agonists. And there are drugs that will block a receptor and those are called antagonists. So a, a drug that stimulates a receptor is an agonist and a drug that blocks a receptor is an antagonist. So here's a little bit more detail on this. So when we have a drug that is an agonist, it is going to basically increase and or intensify the normal action that you would see at that receptor. So they turn on receptors, you can kind of think of them in that way. So in the previous slide, I showed you that picture of the heart and norepinephrine, and I mentioned the drug dobutamine. And dobutamine is a agonist at the receptor that norepinephrine binds. So that receptor, if you remember in the heart, the neurotransmitter norepinephrine binds what we refer to as a beta-1 adrenergic receptor. There's our peripheral nervous system coming up and unfortunately never goes away and we're gonna have to learn it again if we don't remember those terms. So dobutamine is a beta-1 agonist, which means that it stimulates the beta-1 receptor and it's gonna act just like norepinephrine. So it would, we'd see the normal things that you would expect to see when norepinephrine binds. In this case, it would be an increase in the strength of the contraction of the heart, an increase in the um, um, heart rate um, and a potential increase in blood pressure, actually, in that case, or cardiac output. Uh, there's another example down there at the bottom. You don't need to remember dobutamine by name, nor do you need to remember norethindrone, but norethindrone is a progesterone agonist. So it turns on the progesterone receptors. So an agonist is going to be a stimulating at the receptor. An antagonist is going to be the opposite. An antagonist is going to block the receptor. And when it blocks the receptor, it prevents the agonist from getting on there. So it's sort of like blocking the parking spot, if you will. Right. And so when that happens, the normal agonist would not be able to get in there and therefore it wouldn't be able to produce its characteristic response. So a good example that's probably fairly familiar to most of us is an, our antihistamines like Benadryl. So an antihistamine is a drug that blocks the histamine receptors and thereby suppresses the action of histamine. So the deal, again, with these endogenous chemicals like histamine, so we've got histamine that's released by our mast cells or our basophils and all over the place, right? It's a cytokine. And a histamine is a local communicator, if you remember. It's a signaling molecule. And the way the signal works is by the histamine binding the histamine receptor. And when that happens, wherever your histamine is released and it binds the histamine receptor, it causes the normal kinds of things we would expect when histamine get, receptors get hit, which in the case of an allergic sort of a situation, itching, you know, swelling, uh, maybe mucus production, you know, all of those kinds of things. A little bit of vaso, local vasodilation, etc. Um, so what an antihistamine does is it parks on that receptor site. So you, the histamine that is released anyway doesn't get on. It blocks the action of the histamine, and that would be an hist... So in this case, we would call that a histamine antagonist um, or a histamine blocker, right? So that's an, that's an, uh, it has an op opposing effect. Naloxone is another really good example of an antagonist. Naloxone blocks the opioid receptors, and so it's used specifically for cases in cases of overdose with opioids like morph morphine or heroin. And what it does is it just sits on top of that receptor. So the action of morphine or heroin or those kinds of things, those opioids, they have the action is is uh, is the result of in this case morphine binding that receptor. <clears throat> 
So if naloxone's parking on there, mor morphine can't get on there. And so it antagonizes the effect. Excuse me, I have the hiccups. Okay, so in this conversation around antagonism, there's a couple different types of antagonists. <laughs> One is a competitive antagonist, and the other is a non-competitive antagonist. So to make this point, I'm going to revisit what you know, hopefully, about enzymes and enzymatic action. So when you learned about enzymes, you probably learned about competitive and non-competitive inhibition of the enzymes, and sort of the same co concept here. So these are antagonists, and they are going to block receptor sites, just like an ant any antagonist would do, but a competitive antagonist is going to compete for the same receptor site as the endogenous chemical. So essentially, the competitive antagonism is reversible when you add more agonist. And kind of the thing to note here about, and, and this is quite common with neurotransmitters and hormones and these sorts of signalers, is the action is relatively quick. So the neurotransmitter gets released from the neuron that's releasing it, the, the terminal portion of the axon, right? Which is, you remember those terminal fingers of the axon. So the, um, I'm gonna use, in this case, I'm gonna use, um, um, let's use um, acetylcholine, sorry, as our example. So acetylcholine is a ubiquitous neurotransmitter. It's all over the place. And acetylcholine gets released into the synapse, it binds its receptor on the downstream neuron or on a target, and it then hits the receptor and it bounces off and it gets cleaved in the synapse fast. It gets broken down quickly. So by using a competitive antagonist, if, if the competitive antagonist is sitting on the receptor site, that competitive antagonist will also get released, in which case then the pure agonist could get, get in there if it's there in high enough concentration. So essentially the antagonist and the agonist are competing for the same site. That's why it's called competitive antagonism. So you can use the agonist and the competitive antagonist, if you will, to control your de exact degree of response at that particular target. Now a non-competitive antagonist is different. A non-competitive antagonist is going to bind a different site. And when it binds that different site, what it does is it causes a conformational change in the receptor, which is just a protein, and it changes the, the, the actual binding site, the active site. So this is very similar to what you learned about with enzymes when you have a non-competitive when you have non-competitive inhibition. So remember the deal with receptors and proteins in general is they're super structural, right? They're really really structural molecules. And if you change the site, the binding site, the active site, then the true agonist won't be able to get on there for as long as that non-competitive inhibition is happening or for as long as that non-competitive antagonist is happening. So we think about this as being more or less irreversible for the life, during the, the life of that protein. Okay, so competitive and non-competitive antagonism, they're both examples of antagonism, it's just where the antagonist is sitting. If it's, if it's competing for the same active site, we call our binding site, drug binding site, or receptor binding site, we call that competitive antagonism. If it's binding a different site and changing the shape of the active site, that's non-competitive antagonism. In that situation, you could, was, if the site, the binding site, the active site is altered, you could dump all the agonist you want in there and it's not gonna be able to fit. It's like changing the deadbolt, right? It's like changing the locks. So you go with your key, you know, and you're not gonna be able to get in there regardless. So that would be an example of non-competitive. So, so like um, if you just put tape, like a piece of tape over the deadbolt, that would be like competitive antagonism. You could take the tape off and put the key in. Non-competitive antagonism is changing the face of the lock, right? That would be a different scenario. Okay, so that brings us to this one, which is sort of strange, and this is called partial agonists. So these are a little bit interesting. They are kind of, they're, they're both stimulating and inhibitory. So it's, an act, it's a compound which can increase or intensify the activity at a receptor. And in that case, it's called an agonist. So it does stimulate the receptor, but not as much as the pure agonist, the true agonist would stimulate it. So it's like a weak agonist. But 
as it's sitting there, it's also blocking the receptor so the true agonist can't get in there. And so in that case, it is like an antagonist. So it's both. Sometimes in drug reference books, they refer to these as agonists slash antagonists, right? So they're both agonist and antagonist. So you can see that here, they, they have them listed. It's, so here's are the examples that we just talked about. So it, here's the true agonist, right? And so here's our dose response curve. You can see you administer it, you see an effect, that's what you would expect. Let's flip down here to the antagonist. You administer the antagonist, you don't see any effect. That's what you would expect. With the partial agonist, you see it, you administer it, you see about half the response. So it does produce a, an effect, but not as, not as robust as the agonist. And then the agonist plus antagonist, which is kind of the same thing, you know, again, they refer to these sort of as the same thing, and it's the exact same response. So those are agonists, antagonists, partial agonists, and um, agonist plus antagonists. So here's another example of a, um, of a, um, a, a pardon me, <laughs> what am I talking about? It's a um, partial agonist. So what we're looking at here are um, a couple different charts. And we're looking specifically this drug, which is called Tolwin, which is right here. And essentially, when Tolwin is administered on its own, it occupies the same receptor site as an opioid would. Here's our opioid morphine. But it is not going to stimulate it as much, but it will have some response, which in this case, the response we're looking at is to the degree of pain relief. But if a patient is taking this drug, which is Demerol, which is a full agonist, and they're given a large dose of Tolwin, the Tolwin is going to occupy some of the pain receptors as well. And it, they won't get the full benefit of just the meparidine on its own, if you make it the Demerol on its own. So it modulates the response. So one of the benefits of, and then you can see the, the um, difference between um, uh, morphine and um, meparidine in terms of potency. So morphine's a lot more potent, but they're equally efficacious, right? So morphine is a pure agonist as well. Um, efficacy, you can see the efficacy of, of Demerol is it's more efficacious than Tolwin, which you would expect because this is a partial agonist, right? So that's kind of what we're looking at here in this particular picture. So that's a partial agonist. We're not going to talk a lot about partial agonists because they're, they're not used that much. They're really used, the, the, uh, what comes to mind in terms of the most frequent use of partial agonists are in pain management, which there is a lot of utility in that setting. And we'll talk about that when we talk about that in unit six. Um, there are some other partial agonists which are sort of interesting, like the drugs that are used for smoking cessation. A lot of those, like Chantix, I believe, is, is one. That's a very bizarre drug. It causes all kinds of strange side effects. But it's a partial agonist at the nicotine receptor. So it gives the body uh, a little, like it, it makes it feel like it's having some of the effect of nicotine without a pure stimulation of those nicotine receptors. But outside of that, there's not a lot of... We don't use partial agonists that much, so we won't talk about them very often, with the exception of the pain situation. Um, all right, so most uh, most drugs are going to work by receptors, like we talked about. Some are not, and there's a couple examples of some drug actions that are not mediated by receptors. So one pretty good example would be a, an inhalation anesthetic, and what those are doing is they're just dissolving in the mucous membrane, the membrane the membrane of the respiratory tract, and they're decreasing nerve conduction that way, not by interfacing with a specific receptor. Most anesthetics are going to interface with a, block specific receptors, but the volatile anesthetics are not going to do that. Antacids, I think I gave that example earlier, like Alka-Seltzer changes the chemical 
constitu constituency of the lumen of the stomach. It alkalinizes it. An emollient is just basically a moisturizer. You're going to put it on the surface of the skin. It's not going to interface with receptors. Osmodiuretics are examples of basically just uh, the administration of a solute. In this case, mannitol is the one I'm using as an example, which is just a sugar that's not absorbed by the GI tract. And so it basically just pulls water via osmosis. It's just putting water, moving water from one place to the other. That's what that's sort of the utility of osmodiuretics. We'll talk more about, more about those later. Um, there's some laxatives that work this way. Um, magnesium sulfate is one. And then we have some of our chelating agents like EDTA. And these are chelators are going to remove ions or compounds. Another good example of a drug that's that's not mediated by action, that's not mediated by receptors, would be the administration of activated char charcoal into the GI tract, which is a binder. So that's another good example of things that you might be familiar with. So for the most part, for our class, we're going to be talking about drugs actions that are mediated by receptors. So I'm going to come back in our next video and we're going to talk about how we get drugs to their targets. And um, that's going to be probably have to be divided up into a couple videos because there's sort of a lot to this conversation. Okay, I'll see you in a bit.